Okay, so the second talk of the, the day is by the other Francesco Schwarzino, Entropy in Self-Assembly. So he's going to continue from where he left yesterday. Okay, so let uh, me start by uh, reminding you what we have uh, discussed yesterday. We discussed about uh, the importance of uh, entropy in, uh, in soft matter in some sense and the fact that uh, entropy can control uh, ordering processes. We have seen examples in the asphere crystallization, then in the nematic transition when it's uh, rotational entropy that starts to matter. Then we have seen that uh, you can even uh, play with the entropy, with the rotational entropy, with the with vibrational entropy to stabilize the liquid structures compared to crystal and generate the liquids that never crystallize. And then we moved on and discussed uh, the, the, the way entropy attracts. And in particular, we focused on the depletion interaction, showing how the presence of uh, small particles, which uh, cannot uh, get closer than a certain amount to a large colloidal particle, due just to simply entropy effect, produce a net attraction that uh, is so strong that can generate even phase separation, crystallization phenomena, and uh, this type of, uh, where you really need a, a strong interaction compared to KT. Today we, we discuss, we start by discussing another uh, way in which entropy attracts, which I call a safran entropy, to some safran who was the first to really notice uh, this uh, sort, sort of entropy in, uh, in soft matter systems. And then I will discuss uh, other more recent uh, uh, effect of this uh, combinatorial entropy in, uh, in other colloidal particles. And then I will move a little bit uh, to basic concept in self-assembly, really trying to understand what you really uh, need to, to, to understand, to, tail, to design a reasonable self-assembly process. And again, I will stress, due to the topic of the school, the importance of entropy in this, uh, in this type of process. And then finally, I will, if I have time, I think so, I will uh, discuss two or three examples in which uh, entropy and enthalpy compete to create uh, unconventional phenomena. Let's put it this way. Okay, so it's time to start. Uh, let's, let's start discussing this uh, safran entropy. And I do it again with a, with a cartoon. This is a system which was studied a lot in Montpellier some time ago. And it's, uh, essentially those are uh, droplets, uh, oil droplets that you see around here yellow, and then uh, the, you add in the solution of this oil droplet some, uh, some telekelic polymers, some polymers which have uh, hydrophilic part, which is depicted in red, and two hydrophobic parts, which are depicted in blue, and those uh, hydrophobic parts uh, like to stay inside the oil droplet. So the energy for keeping uh, one of these uh, uh, hydrophobic end in the solvent is so strong that all heads of the polymers are confined inside the oil droplets. And so now you have to ask yourself again how entropy is going to play in this system, because this is another example of a system which, uh, despite that there is energy, there is enthalpy, there is uh, this hydrophobic interaction between the, the oil droplet and, uh, and the head of the polymer and, and the solvent water, still the, all oil droplets, all the heads are inside the droplets, and in this respect, uh, all the uh, possible bonds, yellow-blue bonds, are satisfied. So again, despite energy is there, energy doesn't play any role, and we have just to decide if the system is going to go from, uh, will prefer to satisfy all possible contacts uh, just by putting the, the head and the tail of the polymer in the same droplet, or if the system will prefer to share the polymer between different droplets, to, and create, in this case, uh, a network. So which of these two type of configuration uh, do you think as a, uh, as a higher entropy? I'd just like to, first, before I answer to Sri's future question, let me say that uh, already you see here that uh, you, have a, you will have a competition between, uh, again, uh, some kind of translational entropy. These isolated droplets will be able to explore the entire volume of, uh, of the sample, while if they are in, in this network, they are confined and they are localized in the network by the bonds, and so they will lose a lot of translational entropy. 
On the other hand, you might imagine that uh, there is more disorder in, by putting the polymers in different droplets. Gigant. I think uh, I find hard to imagine <laughs> because the, the, if I look at the polymer uh, entropy, yes. uh, these isolated particles should maximize the entropy of the polymer chains as well, right? Because, yeah, if the end-to-end -end distance zero is, is the maximum. Mm -hmm. So I don't see how that could form at all. Yes. But uh, I mean, it's, it's a matter of intuition, I agree. So, I, uh, even, uh, so, okay, so you're saying that uh, you have to also to consider the entropy of the, of the polymer, which is uh, absolutely correct, and that uh, will, might give uh, an important contribution. Fine. Let's see how Safran uh, touched this problem, hmm? and then we compare with the experiments and with some simulation results. Okay, the idea of Safran was very, that we tried to make it very simple and say, okay, let's assume that I want to be really, uh, really simple and I, I assume that there is no uh, interplay between the droplets uh, and, uh, and, and the polymer. So there are two different uh, non-interacting systems so that I can write the, my free energy as the free energy of the droplets plus the free energy of the polymers. And of course, the droplets are just uh, assume that they are spheres, so you can assume that they are an ideal gas if the density is small, or you can assume a Karna Starling type of free energy if you want to be a little bit more realistic and describe yes, the droplets as hard spheres. And then you have the free energy of the polymers. And again, you assume that the, the, the concentration of polymer is small, so the whole polymer can be treated independent. There, is, there are no polymer-polymer interactions. And so you, have to, you, write, you can write the free energy of the polymers in terms of log n times the, the free energy of the single drop, single polymer. And now you have to write the, the partition function of the, of the single droplet, and you make it in a very simple way again. He says, okay, let's, assume, let's count in how many ways I can put the head of, the, of, the, of this polymer that I'm looking at. And uh, I assume that the head of the polymer occupies a certain fraction of the surface. They call it sigma polymer. This is the surface of the head. I, and I say, I count the number of different ways I can, I put, I can, different, yeah, ways I can put my head just by dividing the surface of the oil droplet by the surface of the polymer. So in this way, get an estimate of the number of points where you can put the first head of the polymer. Then he has to, to locate the second head. And to locate the second head, what he does, he said, okay, I will, I can, uh, now I put the second head in two ways, and this parenthesis is the second head, the final, the final one. And of course, you can put uh, the final one in the same droplet, and then you have this number of states, like, uh, like you had before. But now you can also put the head in, the, in another droplet. And so now you have uh, multiplied the number of states that you have for a single droplet by the number of droplets that you can access. And this is, is going to be, in some sense, uh, uh, proportional to the, the number of droplets that you can join, you can reach within the length of the polymer. So this is something that is going to be proportional to the density of droplets in the systems, right? Okay, this polymer will never be able to attach to that droplet, it's too far, that's what I'm trying to say. So there will be some radius, which is, will be controlled more or less by the typical length of the polymer, the end to end distance, average end to end distance of the polymer, and this will fix this uh, number of accessible droplets. But for Safran, again, make a very simple approximation. Assume that the droplets have a G of R, which is uh, one. I don't want to enter too much, but the point is that uh, this number here is proportional to sigma t. So in doing this, he's neglecting this uh, entropy of the polymer that she was, was alluding in this type of calculation, saying that the polymer is going to use some configuration in which he maximizes own entropy in, in both type of uh, configuration, both in the, single hand, in the single droplet and between different droplets. Okay, so now you have a free energy which is function of two parameters, the density of the droplets and the density uh, of the, and the number of polymers, the density of, uh, of telecalic polymers. So you have to calculate this, you can calculate the free energy, you can see, what, you can calculate the spinodal line, so the line where this free energy becomes, uh, uh, lose the, the system loses stability. And of course, you have to take the second derivative. There will be, there will be three possible ways of losing stability due to the fluctuation density of the droplet, due to the density of the, of the polymer, or due to the mixed term. So you diagonalize 
this, uh, this metric C of second derivatives, uh, and thus this uh, will have two uh, eigenvalues. When one of these eigenvalues becomes zero, you are at the spinodal, at the spinodal point. So you can now plot the phase diagram for this, and what he gets is this type of phase diagram here. So this is a concentration of uh, uh, droplets, so many droplets you have in your system, and this is the number of polymer that you put per droplet. And he predicts that there is a phase separation, like to you to see here, this is the spinodal curve, which uh, connect points, uh, and uh, so all those lines here are the so-called tie lines. So if, if you prepare a system, let's say, with this concentration, with this average number of droplets, it will phase separate in a low concentration with, a, with the less number of polymers and a higher concentration with a larger number of polymers. So there will be fractioning of the polymers uh, in the system. If you compare, uh, so in some sense, what is, uh, this result, what this tells us is that indeed, uh, if you prepare a system, you will face separate in a, in, a, in, a, in, in a gas of droplets in which the polymer will be in the same droplet, but it will also separate, the other phase will be a network. So essentially, there will be competition between these two, these, these two structures here. There will be coexistence between these two structures here. If you are at very low concentrations, you will have the gas phase, isolate the droplet. If you have a very high concentration, you always have the network. And in the middle, you have coexistence between the two. So again, entropy can help in producing a network of, uh, of, uh, of droplets. These uh, theoretical results have to be compared with the experimental result in producing Montpellier, which you have this, uh, again, this two-phase region was seen. The critical point was located there. And uh, so the system was separated in a gas uh, or droplets and in a network, a transient gel air. So the x-axis is the concentration of droplet, and the y-axis is the concentration of, is the number of polymer per droplet. Number of polymers per droplet. Yes, so. Yeah, that's attraction strength. The more you put, the, the more combinatorial entropy you have, which produces this. Uh, this effect here. There is also another line here that uh, you can calculate uh, theoretically, or you can, uh, especially in mean field, is, we will discuss this later. And uh, there is a, or you can measure experimentally as the onset of your, uh, uh, of your elasticity in the system. And this line uh, signals the presence of an infinite cluster, a spanning cluster of uh, bonded droplets. So you go essentially from a salt phase where you have isolated droplets or small clusters to a, a phase where you have a network of these uh, uh, connected uh, droplets. All this, again, fully controlled by entropy. Uh, is one independent variable. Yes. So the y-axis you control by just the number of emulsion droplets you have. The x-axis uh, I control by the number of emulsion droplets. Oh, there's the concentration of emulsion droplets. So this is the droplets. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And this is the polymers. And that you control by the po po polymer concentration. How many polymers I put. So I have, uh, yeah. I have uh, 10, 10 polymers for each droplet, let's say. And that's I'm here. So the number of, uh, of bonds in some sense. You increase the number of bonds there that you can have. But the point is that the system, in some sense, has reasonable density, prefers to bind. So there is attraction induced by this entropy. That's the message. Sorry. Um, now, in, in the free energy that you used, the entropy came into how many ways in which a polymer head could attach to a microemulsion droplet. And that entropy was greater if it was not restricted to attaching to the same droplet. That's the basic idea, right? But the, the unperturbed free energy you used was just the kahn starling kind of free energy. Yes. That, that, but, but that um, is probably an overestimate of the entropy in the gel phase because that's a liquid free energy you're using, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So those systems, I mean, those are always uh, physical gels. So in, in, in the real system, there is a finite uh, uh, res residence time for this, uh, for this head. So once in a while, which is a very rare, they evaporate from a droplet and they try another contact. So there is an equilibrium that you can reach 
on the time scale that is longer than this residence time. So for a very short amount of time, the oil droplet can be also in the solvent. The, the head of the polymer can be in the solvent, but it's a small time compared to the time that it spends inside the, the droplet, and so you assume that energy doesn't play any role. This has, these things have been uh, also checked uh, in simulation, uh, the work of Ludovic Perrier, Walter Cobb, and Pablo Tado. And uh, again, they, they did a very simple model of droplets that you see drop here, and the polymers, is, those are these red, uh, red lines connecting. Different colors are different clusters. And they uh, checked that they have a phase resistance over there, a so or a small number of polymers, and a gel a connected network in this area here. So it's not very close to what has been seen in experiments or in simulation. This has been done for uh, also to check uh, the, the way the uh, autocorrelation functions in some here in a almost a glass physics, like this, let me stress it, the way the correlation function behave in the case of a dynamical arrest produced by a, a percolation transition. And uh, we will discuss this a little bit uh, perhaps in the Friday lectures. Again, so, but there is a some peculiar physics, peculiar way in which the correlation function uh, change on uh, in slowing down the dynamics when you uh, approach a, a percolation transition, which is different, has some similarity, but is different from the one of a glass transition. We will come back to this on Friday. Okay, let me show another systems, another uh, recent soft matter system in which this idea of combinatorial entropy plays also an important role. And those are the, for example, this, uh, the, uh, this uh, gold uh, grafted uh, particles. And the, the particles are grafted with DNA strands, like you see in this, uh, in this plot here. Roughly, these are the part, the particles can be 5, 10, 20 nanometers if it's gold. And you can attach uh, uh, 20 to 50 DNA strands uh, on the surface of the particle, depending on the particle diameter. You can do similar things also at the colloidal level and the, the micron scale. You can attach on uh, micron particles also DNA, and you, you get similar physics out of it. But let me just discuss this, this simple case of uh, gold nanoparticles. Now, on these particles, uh, the idea is that you have a, a, a sequence of DNA which is uh, inert, or in this case is uh, double helix. And then at the end, you have some, I don't know if you can see, some isolated bases that can be used to bind to other of these particles. The trick very often is to use, uh, well, not always, but very often is to use what people call palindromic DNA sequences, like the one I show you here. For example, this is a six letters uh, palindromic sequence, C, G, A, T, G, C. And palindromic in the sense of DNA means that uh, Every time you have a, a G, on the other side you have a C. Every time you have a T, on the other side you have a A. So, G, and so if you read on this side, you read G, C, T, A, C, G, C. If you read it from this side, it's the opposite. Now, the, the, why these palindromic sequences are important in this type of colloidal particle is because those palindromic sequences are allowed to form a, a double helix with the, the same sequence. So you don't need to have... A, complementary sequences, those are self-complementary in some sense. So if you put the end of this DNA as uh, one of these palindromic sequences, then this will be able to bind to any identical sequence of any other particle or in principle on the same particle. Another important thing that uh, people have exploited in this uh, uh, edition of uh, DNA coated particle is that uh, you can use the length of the DNA to control the temperature when you want this particle to self-assemble, to aggregate. If you make uh, the DNA very long, then uh, the melting temperature, so the temperature at which this uh, pairing takes place, is very high, roughly 80 Celsius. But if you make the sequence uh, much shorter, like say eight, then you can move the melting temperature to ambient temperature. And you can control this temperature also with salt or with the base sequences. But the important message is the length of the DNA sequence control the temperature where the, the melting will take place. For fun, I checked what is the longest Italian palindromic word, and this is a cavalla vacca. And this is an instrument where you can lift the cows. cows. So I don't know if you have in India similar instruments, but it's a kind of bike, a small bike. It's, the, it's a pity that I didn't find a better resolution. But you can lift a cow and move it. Uh, a cavallavaka, you can check, it's a, it's a palindrome. Maybe in, in, uh, in Sanskrit or in your language, there is some 
equally long word that is so interesting. Okay, so let me say why I'm uh, interested in this, uh, in this palindromic signal, because now you, you see the problem. It's very similar to the one we discussed with Safran before, with the other particle. You can have a, a, a particle which is decorated by this DNA with some sticky ends, and this, if this sticky end is palindromic, it can bind to itself. So in principle, if you have, again, a low density, this particle, and uh, you lower the temperature, then this... Uh, uh, palindromic ends will find partners and your particle will be inert, completely inert. But you can have uh, also the similar uh, phenomenology, even particles decorated with two different types of complementary DNA. So if it's palindromic, you have this phenomenon, if you can but you, and then you can decorate with just one type of DNA. Have a similar physics, just even by decorating with two different DNA which are complementary. And again, if you lower the temperature and you have an isolated particle, you're going to find this pairing between the DNA sequence like here. And again, now you can pose the same questions that we have posed for the, for the saffron type. If I put together two of these particles, would they prefer to bind between themselves or would they prefer to, uh, to remain isolated and gain this translational entropy, this log V term that again we will discuss more carefully later on. In the case of palindromic sequence, then you might expect to see this type of sequence where you have some intra-particle bond and some inter-particle bond. And in the game of complementary DNA, you can have a similar physics. So you can uh, check this uh, uh, on the computer, for example, just to clarify what is happening and then uh, uh, try to see the experiments. So, um, for example, if, you, if I take two of these particles and I bring them together and I, I can uh, measure you know, on the computer the so-called effective interactions between the two particles. And now this effective interactions, just, just a moment, this effective interaction is going to be only entropic because uh, at any, at low temperature, any time, at any distance, the particle will always be all bonded. So again, it will be an entropic uh, interaction that we will detect. Please. Okay, so the, the difference between, maybe I was not clear, the difference between these two systems is that in this case, the particle is decorated with palindromic sequences. In this case, it's decorated with the two different DNA sequences that can bind to each other. For example, one could be, the, the blue could be poly T, and the other, the red could be poly A. And A and T will bind. So just to show that uh, the same physics can be realized all with palindromic sequences, which is easy because you decorate with just one strand. This is easy to make your sample, or, but you can even get the same problems when you have uh, a binary mixture of DNA on the surface of the particle. Okay, so we, let's see what happened first to the number of bonds. So, I, so I'm do the, I do the simulation, a low temperature, I put together I move these two particles, there's some distance between the two particles that I'm plotting here. So the relative distance between the two particles. I move them together, and then uh, I see that there are... Uh, and here I plot uh, the total number of bonds that I see in my system. There are 42 strands, so I get 42 bonds in the system, at most. And you see that the number of bonds is always going to be the same. It doesn't change with the relative distance. And now you count the number of bonds between different particles. And you see that it goes start from zero, and then it goes up to roughly 10 in this, uh, for this realization that I show you here. So now I would like to really quantify what is this entropy, that uh, gain that comes from the fact that now I'm making bonds between different particles compared to bonds between the same particle. And let's see how I, I have to do this combinatorial uh, exercise. I say, okay, let's assume that I have a certain number of bonds that can form. And uh, let's assume that do, uh, on, on the particle A, and that's part, that this bond will form between themselves. So each, there will be a certain number, an A minus an A bonds, an A half bond that I can put here. Right? And I count in a many different way, I can put bonds between uh, an A uh, strands. And this is just uh, uh, an A minus one uh, double factorial. At the same time, so if the particle are isolated, like here, and I count on many different configuration of bond I can form, then this is uh, the number of strands. In this case, Na is 8. My, uh, an 8 minus 1 is 7. Uh, no, 4 bonds, sorry. Uh, and then I get uh, 
have to do the, this double factorial and tells you how many different ways you can get. The other particle is isolated, and also this other particle has a certain number of bonds that can be formed. You count them how many you can, and so since they are isolated, you have the product. And this is the total number of, of possible bonded state that you can have in this case. But now you put the particle together, so now there will be this particle can also bind to that particle. So now you have a much larger number of, of possible binding sites. You have an A plus and B minus one double factorial ways of doing it. And so now you can have a, to calculate the effective potential between the two particles. You need to know exactly the number of bonds that you can form. And then from there, you can put this number in here and got change, calculate the change of entropy. So this is the entropy assuming that they are bonded and then you have to subtract uh, in, in a mixed way. And this is the chain entropy that you have uh, when, if they are bonded only intra, with intra bonds. And you see that there is this entropic term that comes out. Now you take this expression, you plot it, and that's uh, what you get, this, uh, this attractive potential that you see here. So, you, so it's, uh, it's 10 kT. So you can, uh, with the 40 strengths, you get already a combinatorial contribution of 40 kT which is really binds very, very strongly the particle. Now, of course, uh, that effect, the total effective potential is the sum of the repulsion due to the grafting of the DNA on the surface, which is uh, this red line. So they have the red line, which is the repulsive grafting between the uh, potential. You have the entropic attraction coming from combinatorial terms. You sum the two and you get the effective potential between the particle, which has a minimum of few kT that uh, brings the particle together. So this is a, a nice way of controlling the strength of your uh, interaction potential because it doesn't really depend anymore from the length of the DNA that you use. It's just combinatorial. So if I, just the number of bonds that I have, and I can, uh, I can make the bond uh, as strong as I want by grafting in a different way the surface of my particle. So again, another strong entropic attractive effect that you can modulate. And, To my earlier question, um, I mean, the polymer entropy is still not appearing in all of these calculations, right? Yes, in some and, sense and here. Where, it's here. In, in the repulsive part. But then... Oh. Because that is the end, of assuming the, I switch off the attraction. Right. Then what is left is just uh, the uh, conformational entropy of the polymers. It's in this picture here, you see. Here. So I, I can switch off uh, these this four bases right. and ask what happened to the two particles when I, I move them close by. And that's just the, the number of ways you can put the polymers in space. Okay. I'll think, I'll think about it. Yeah. Yeah, all this is, uh, even, the, even the repulsive part is entropic in this case, yes. Okay, so let me go to the last example of this uh, com combinatorial entropy, if you like to call it. This is work by the group of uh, Dan Frankel a few years ago. And the question that they asked was, how can I design a particle, a nanoparticle, that uh, stick to, in, a, in an effective way to, uh, to a cell surface? Now, the cell surface is decorated with the receptors and the particles are decorated with ligands. And so you want uh, the best, uh, uh, we want in principle uh, control the amount of particles that you uh, stick on the surface by changing the number of reception that, receptor that you have on the surface. So ideally, what you would like is something like this, this uh, ideal switch. So you increase uh, the number of, of receptors and then at a certain point, you have a complete absorption of the particle on the surface. This would be the, the best way to control, the most effective way to control the, the, the logical function. But if you, if you make a simple nanoparticle with one ligand that binds to one receptor, what you get, you can control essentially the strength of this interaction here. And then you, you see, if you do the calculation, that uh, the number of particles that uh, goes on the surface is given by this schemoidal curve, and we will derive this curve later on. And you see that this curve is uh, irrelevant, it doesn't really change too much with the strength that you put. You can shift it by, by changing the strength, but the shape remains the same. 
But this is just a shift. This curve is the same as this one, just shifted. So if you make it this, this interaction very strong, you can move it to the left. If you make the interaction very weak, you can move it to the right. But you don't really gain in steepness. So how can you gain in steepness? Again, you can gain in steepness by using entropy. So what you do essentially, or this was the idea that they proposed, was to take a nanoparticle and decorate it with many ligands, say k ligands per nanoparticles. And then say that uh, you're, uh, on the surface you have a certain number of receptors per site that we call an R. So now your, your particle will bind with many different ways here. So let's see how can we calculate the partition function for this type of, uh, of binding here. So let's try to estimate this, the partition function associated to this bonded state. This unbonded state is just the log V, so we don't really care too much. This, let's look at this bonded state. So what do you do? You have to estimate the number of ways you can form a certain number of bonds if you have K ligands and a certain number of receptors. And so of course, if you, if you let's first uh, decide which of this uh, N, which, uh, which fraction of this, uh, sorry, not, not which fraction, which of these K uh, ligands are going to be bonded. So that's the first thing. So I know that I have a, a certain number of bonds. So this is the combinatorial term that tells you the number of ways you can put, you can create this number of bonds out of K ligands that you have. And now that you have selected the number of bonds, you have to touch the side where you put these bonds on the surface. So which of these squares we are going to saturate. And again, this is what happens. But now when you go to larger number of receptors, there is a transition and while the monovalent is really a small concentration still, the multivalent, in this case, uh, there, there are two, four, six, seven, seven or eight, uh, K, seven or eight, there are seven or eight ligands, then you see that many particles are absorbed on the surface of, it, of the cell. So this is again another way in which entropy controls the, the self-assembly of this particle on the surface. Okay, so this, is, this was just to, to convince you that, uh, again, we can use different sources of entropy to control attraction between particles, and we can generate uh, assembled state like gels or networks using these uh, entropic forces. Now let me go to the, another case in which, uh, also interesting, in which uh, entropy plays uh, an interesting role. And this, uh, <coughs> I like to, to discuss this also because for its connection to the glass physics of strong glass formers in some sense. And I like to call it this, there is life uh, in the ground state, meaning this is a system which lives in the ground state, but there is still dynamics in the ground state. And that there is dynamic because entropy is, uh, is working for it. So this is a system which has been introduced in, uh, in Paris by Ludwig Leibler. And this is a plastic. It's a mixture of two different uh, polymers, a polymer with different functionality. Those are the polymers. I I'm not a chemist. I don't want to enter too much. But the, the, the concept is that uh, this, this uh, mixture of polymers are, is made by polymer, let's say, in this plot with functionality 3, the color 1, and functionality 4, which are the black one. Hmm? And uh, he makes uh, a binary mixture of these two polymers uh, in a non-stoichiometric ratio. This is a, a key point. So if you have a stoichiometric ratio, then uh, you, gener you are able to satisfy all possible bonds in the system. And then uh, there will be no free ends. All, all free ends here will be saturated if you would make a, the right ratio between uh, the two types of polymers. But if you make a non-stoichiometric uh, mixture of these two particles, then uh, even when you form all possible bonds, there will be some free ends. Like you see this, uh, you, have, you have put a majority of this uh, tetravalent particle, tetravalent polymer, and so there will be a lot of free ends in the system. And then uh, he designed a chemistry, a reaction, chemical reaction, which allowed to swap these free ends. So when a free end gets close to an existing bond, so like here, this, this, there's this free end here, uh, you see this uh, purple point dot over there, it gets close to an existing bond, then there is a chemical reaction, an exchange reaction, so that uh, now the new bond is formed between these two particles and the, the free ends has moved to that one, to the, the blue one. So the important thing here in this process is that the number of bonds in the system has never changed. It's always remained the same, but the system is able to evolve. 
is able to explore all possible configurations which are available to the system. This is, there are a lot of very nice, uh, if you really want to learn about these uh, new polymer types and uh, the possible uh, technological application, there are a lot of uh, nice links that you can uh, look up on the, on the web. This is a very, this is a, a lecture, a very nice lecture, and this is just a simple explanation of what you can do with, the, with these polymers. Let me just show you the connection to the glass. Those are, uh, this is the material that we are talking about. So you see it's a, it's a plastic, but now you can warm it up. When you warm it up, you activate a cat the catalyst that catalyzes this swap reaction. So the bonds start to swap, and you, the, the system essentially retains its integrity, but become locally fluid. And so you can uh, shape in a different way, and then you cool it down again, and it retains the final shape that you want. So you can really model the plastic, you can heal, and it's, and it's, you can release all the stress that is in the material just by, by playing with the, the temperature, which activate the catalyst. And if you compare the... the no, does this sort of reminiscent of shape memory materials, is there shape memory here? No, this doesn't have any no, memory. No, no, no memory. This is the beauty. I mean, you, by swapping the bonds, you completely lose any previous information. You go to the equilibrium. And the equilibrium means usually no stress in the system. Okay. So once you have, so you start from this one, you warm it up, it becomes a fluid, you bend it the way you like, you cool it down, like you do with silica when you get a glass object. You warm it up, you shape it, you cool it down. Okay, so there is no reference state to go back. No, no, no. no There's no reference state no. to go back. It, it's really an, an equilibrium liquid. So, and now if you compare these materials here with the silica or with other strong glass formers, it's even stronger. So it's better than silica in some sense, in, in terms of its uh, Arrhenius behavior. It's a network. It's not a surprise that it's a strong liquid. The thing that I was telling you before, you need a network structure to have a strong liquid. Okay, so let's uh, think about it. Uh, I mean, this is uh, the same as a system of particles with different uh, functionality, different valence. So you can, in principle, think of this as a patchy particle system. Particle with three patches, particle with four patches. You mix them together. Those particles uh, go to the ground state. So the minority particle get completely satisfied, all bonds formed. And then there are still some uh, bonds which you can use uh, to, to swap. And this means that you can evolve in the ground state. Because the system reaches the ground state where all possible bonds are formed, but then there is still motion in the ground state. Let me show just a cartoon of this, uh, of what is happening. You, you start with two different pieces of these materials. And again, I'm, I'm just stressing there is no energy involved. Again, it's, everything is entropy. This, these two pieces of materials uh, uh, move in the box. Once in a while, they find each other, and then they start to form bonds. You see that uh, there are some particles which uh, evaporate from this one. Right there. Some other particles start to evaporate, the more bonds are formed, and the, the, the system joins in one piece. So you retain integrity. Can we understand this uh, on a physical point of view? Yes, I'm saying this, this is the physics of, of patchy particle in some sense, a particle of certain, fun certain functionality. It doesn't really matter if they are polymers or particles. So you can think of this as a, just a system of uh, patchy particle. I mean, I don't draw the patches here, and, but you can uh, just add uh, an, a swap mechanism that allow you to swap bonds between the particles. But uh, the, the physics is the same. So let's look at the thermodynamics of this system. What do we, we get? We've learned a lot about the thermodynamic of patchy particle in, in the last uh, 10, five years. So we know how to deal with this patchy particle. So let's, let's look quickly the free energy for this system. So in this case, I write it for a binary mixture of particle with uh, four patches, which are the purple one, and, par and particle with two patches, which are the, the, the green one, and the four can only bind to the two. So four patchy particle, two patchy particle, only four to two bonds, like here. So if I have uh, a stoichiometric ratio, like you have in this uh, graph over here, you see all bonds are satisfied. All particles have four bonds. The system is in the ground state, and there is no activity possible because all bonds are satisfied. But here, there is a, ma a majority component of bivalent particles. So now you have that all the purple tetravalent particles are all bonded. You see. But still, there is an excess uh, free ends 
of the, of the small particle type. And those particles, in principle, can, can swap if you have the proper uh, swap dynamics. But let's look at the thermodynamics first. So how can I describe the free energy of, of this type of system? Well, we know that for this patchy particle, there is this first time theory that uh, works very well. And this, this free energy essentially is the sum of three contributions. Bond free energy, so that the contribution of the free energy comes from the formation of the bonds. The reference free energy that you can take as hard spheres before. And the mixing free energy since you have a, a two component system over here. So all this is standard. The mixing free energy, we know how to write it. The R sphere free energy, we know how to write it. It's starling So the only piece of information is this bond free energy. And interestingly, if you go to very low temperature, this bond free energy, as written by this time theory, can be expanded in a very simple way, which comes out to be this one. So this is the low temperature expression for this bond free energy. And this comes out two contributions. Let's, let's look at the two contributions. This one is the contribution which comes from the formation of a bond. So you have, uh, when you form a bond, you lose a certain amount of bonding volume. So you, and compared to the volume of the box that you could explore. So this is a so-called translational entropy again. You gain an energy epsilon by forming the bonds. And this so you have to multiply by the number of bonds that you have in the system. Now, since the number of bonds in the system is constant, all this piece here is constant. So it doesn't play any role. And then there is this combinatorial terms, which is this entropic term, which is nothing more than a combinatorial contribution. And this in the case, uh, so you have uh, four times the number of uh, purple particles, uh, a binding site uh, of type A, and then there are two times the number of green particles binding site of type B. And for example, if you work uh, with a majority of B, then you have just to say that you're sure that, that uh, all these all this bonds will be, will be formed. You just to decide that in how many different ways you can put the minority bonds on the majority bonds. And so, it's, again, it's a combinatorial term. The first you can put in a certain number of ways, the second in a certain number of ways, minus one, and so on. And so you end up with this expression, again, of the combinatorial term, which is here. So all this uh, is derives uh, nicely from this very time theory, but again, tells you that... Uh, Everything that is controlling the thermodynamic of the system at low temperature, when you fix the temperature to a low value so that all bonds are formed and these terms become irrelevant, everything is written here, plus the free energy. So VB is the volume, we will discuss this better later, but it's the volume over which you can form a bond. So in the Kerr-Frank would be the volume of the, of the cone or the patch. Okay, so once you have the free energy, you can look at the, uh, first of all, you can compare how good this free energy is. This is a mean field, completely mean field. Still, uh, this is the comparison with the actual numerical data for the, for the entropy that you can calculate with thermodynamic integration like we discussed yesterday. And there is a reason why mean field is working so nicely here. So, I mean, those uh, patchy particles, uh, small valence, uh, they are very nice mean field systems. That's uh, what we have learned. And the reason why they are very nice mean field system is because they, they, do, they have very small loops, closed loops. So you can, any beta type expansions work nicely. And you can see also from here. So let's look at the, what the phase diagram is. Now the phase diagram is, of course, it's, uh, there is no temperature. low temperature phase diagram where all bonds are formed. You have two parameters, the total density in the system, the number of particles, and the relative fraction. And the system predicts, again, now you should be used to this idea that entropy can generate phase separations. The, the theory predicts a, a, coexist, a phase separation, a regional instability, which is this one inside this, this curve here, and the region of stability, which is outside. Again, you have percolation threshold so that you can calculate in mean field. One is located here at this relative fraction, and this is one located there. So you have a fluid phase here, a percolating phase, a phase separation, a percolating phase, and a non-percolating phase over there. Now let's uh, look at uh, what uh, this picture of the movie of the two moving particles. So that was a quench here, so a system with a very low, uh, low average density with a certain relative concentration. This system is going to phase separate, that's what the thermodynamic tells us, in a gas and in an almost perfect network. And that's exactly what we saw in that movie before, that we started with the relative low densities and the system created one big uh, 
aggregate, which has the, the correct, the almost perfect network uh, relative ratio between particles and uh, isolated low density, just uh, type A particles, that's man, the majority species gas particles. So we learn that from, uh, we understand all this from this theory. Okay, so in the remaining uh, time, let me now try to clarify all these little pieces that uh, I've shown you here. I've told you this web, what is uh, central mass entropy. I talked about the bonding volume. So let's, let's clarify all this, uh, this, all this concept that will be useful for the, for the next lecture. Okay, so this is just, uh, I want to give you just a few basic ideas of what really controls a fast assembly. And I do it in, in the simplest way that you can do it. Uh, in, a, in a, assuming that uh, they might be aggregated, that I'm, I, I, part, I start with some particles, some particles, some, some bond that they can form, like here. They can form aggregate, and this would be monomer, dimer, trimers, and so on. And I do this at low density so that I can, in principle, neglect the interaction between the aggregates that I'm going to form. So my idea is I start from a particle. I, I know uh, the number of bonds that the particle can form, the functionality, the number of patches, if you like, uh, if you work with patchy particle, but it's very general. The number of DNA strands, for example, it can be any, any, anything that controls the valence. You can do this also for square well. Nothing, nothing changes. The, the concept is similar. <laughs> so I want to predict uh, the cluster side distribution. I want to know how many of these this aggregates I'm going to find at different temperature and density. So I have to write the partition function of, of my system. It's an ideal gas. So I know how to write it. So it's going to be the partition function of, of the aggregate of sites n to the power of the number of aggregates that I'm going to find, normalized by this combinatorial term for identical clusters. And then I take this and have to multiply by all possible cluster sites from one to infinity. So this is uh, the simple way of writing the ideal gas free energy for, uh, for a a mixture of, of clusters. Now, what is this, uh, this partition function here? This partition function here is the standard partition function of a system of, of n particles. Oh, so this should be, n should be not capital, sorry. So n, n particles here. There's uh, just a tiny difference, which is this, I uh, put this uh, prime sign over there to, to stress that uh, I have to integrate only over all configuration in which the cluster is formed. So the, the end part cannot be isolated. They have to be bonded, right? So I, in, in this sum here over the all possible uh, positions of the particle and angles, in principle, I have to sum only in all the configuration in which the particles are forming an aggregate of sites n. So the first thing you have to say, I consider two particles to be bonded if this is uh, the rule. The distance has to be less than something or the angles has to be less than something. And once you have the rule that tells you the two particles are bonded, now you have to integrate over all possible geometries in which the particle form an aggregate. Okay, let's just make sure that we understand what I'm saying. Let's take a, a, a two particle, a dimer. Let's see how we should write this partition function. Now we can simplify it. We have to integrate over all possible orientation and positions of, of this time. And again, yeah, the particle has to be bonded. So how do you solve this uh, nicely? You say, okay, first of all, let me go, the first particle, I put it in the middle, or I, I, I work with relative, con, relative uh, positions. So the first particle can go everywhere in the, in the box. So I will get a, a term V, the volume, and this is the entropy, the center of mass translational entropy. It's the cluster can be anywhere, anywhere in the volume, so I get an entropy contribution V. Then uh, the second particle has to be bonded. So if the particle has to be bonded, it has to be only within a certain number of reduced volume, which allow for bond to be there. So this can be, for example, in a square well, the distance has to be less than the distance of the, the, the size of the square well. And if you have a, a, an angular interaction, even the relative orientation has to be less than some cutoff parameter that you put. So this is, everything is coded inside this bonding volume. And then there will be some Boltzmann term, which is essentially the strength of the, of the bond. So I'm, I'm assuming that I can quant quantize my interaction potential with one energy scale and the bonding volume value over there. So that's the idea of this partition function. The monomer, it, it's easy to do it. We, we know the partition function of the monomer. The monomer will have only the partition function there. So now I can write my free energy, the log of Q, and that's what I get. 
I need to calculate the, the, this cluster size distribution. So I know, the, I know this partition function, I know the free energy, but uh, I know it in terms of this distribution that I need to calculate. And I use the, the, the idea that the free energy has to be a minimum, so I minimize this expression under the constraint that uh, the sum of uh, all the particles in the system remain constant. So if I take a cluster of sites n, this has n particles. So I sum over all cluster sites, and this has to be to the total number of particles that are in the system. So I, I just to, to get this uh, nn, the, what, the thing that I look, by minimizing the free energy under this constraint. So I have a, a Lagrange multiplier, if I do that, just a moment, and then uh, if I minimize, I get this expression. This expression here tells it's, it's, it's still in terms of this Lagrange parameter that you don't know, but uh, you can uh, calculate this because you know that uh, for in the case of monomers, it's going to be an, a row a Q1 exponential of alpha. So you can recast everything in terms of concentration of monomer. And you get this important results that the number of clusters of sites n that you are going to find in your system is essentially proportional to the partition function of that cluster. Modulus uh, some uh, row one to the n that uh, is essentially tells you what is the average density in the systems. So the, the important message is you want to uh, an aggregate to be very persistent and probably Sanat Kumar in his lecture on the, uh, on the micromulsion said discuss this issue too. also. You need to have a partition function which is very, very large, very intense compared to the other sizes. Uh, <clears throat> you didn't say it, but what you did was to go to the grand canonical mm -hmm. uh, ensemble, right? Because no. that that uh, exponential alpha will be the fugacity. No, no, I didn't do that. I just say, no? I just say, I have my Lagrange multiply that allow me to enforce this constraint over there. That's all. Oh, but that's the total number of particles. Mm -hmm. That's a change of ensemble. Uh, of course, then uh, this then becomes related yeah. to the if I can cast it in a different way, but uh, in principle, I don't need it. Yeah, because you're getting you're getting all exponential alpha to be what is the monomer concentration? So it's here. Yeah, but that that's the ideal gas. Uh, so it's a monomer is that activity. So you can think of that in terms of an expansion in activity. But that's uh, I can I can try to be more simple by somebody not to. Yes, so this is the, uh, all these clusters are in thermodynamic equilibrium. So the, uh, you don't need to even make this, uh, so this is just uh, row one, is then concentration of monomers. Now the concentration of mono in the ideal gas coincides with the activity. So this is an expansion in the activity. And since uh, there is a thermal, thermodynamic equilibrium between the different clusters, uh, the activity, the chemical potential of the particles is the same in all clusters. So it's the same as the one of the monomer. And hence, it's activity in all cases. I'm, uh, I, can, I, I can cut in many places, <laughs> so I'm happy. Yeah. No, I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering aloud, thinking aloud, um, if you were to do... Yes, <laughs> allowed and loud. Um, now, in, if, if this is assuming that you have a gas of monomers, yes. right? No, a gas of clusters. And a gas of clusters, but... In thermodynamic equilibrium. Right. Yes. But if, if you were sort of looking at some kind of condensation process in the liquid state, that part would change dramatically. Right. Uh, I've not put uh, any cluster cluster interaction here. So no, no, not be any hmm. condensation. Okay. Okay. Let me just as a, as an exercise. Let's do it for a simple case, the simplest case that you can think. So you have um, two type of monomers, type A and type B, and uh, these two monomers can form a dimer. So you have uh, three possible clusters in the system: type A, type B, and uh, dimer. And of course, uh, you have, uh, this time you have two constraints that you have to satisfy. The number of uh, cluster of type A plus the number of cluster of type AB has to be identical to the number of uh, monomer of type A that you put in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And the same for, for the B, the number of B, 
as the number of AP has to be the same as the, or the, or the number of P particles that you put in the beginning. And let's, for simplicity, assume that we start with a 50-50 mixture, so total number of particles divided by two in both cases. Now you write the partition functions, it's the product of, uh, of the partition functions. You minimize the partition function, and now you have uh, two Lagrange multiplier, one for this constraint and one for that constraint. And you, you do a little bit of math, so say simple math, and you get uh, what is the number of, uh, of cluster of type AB, this type, or cluster of this type, of this type that you have in the system. Now, for clarifying what is really happening, let's uh, discuss this quantity that I call bond probability. So it's the number of bonds that you have formed, which is identical to the number of dimers that you have in the system, divided by the, <coughs> the total number of bonds that you can form in principle, which is going to be N0 over 2. So this is the fraction of, of uh, particles which are bonded, essentially, the bond probability. And now you can uh, essentially, since this is nothing more than NAP, is the solution that you see there. You solve it, and uh, you get, uh, if you put for the partition function of, the, of A, the volume, for B, the volume, and for that one, what we had discussed before, V, V, B, E to the minus beta U, you end up with this expression here. that tells you the number of bonds as a function of temperature and density in your system. Let's look how this, uh, this function looks like. So this is the number of bonds as a function, the same as I've copied there. And you see that there are two terms in here. One is this one, which is the total number of, of uh, bonded volume divided by, so this is the bonding volume times the number of particles divided by the volume of the system. So it's the ratio between the bonding volume and the volume per particle, you see that here. And this is entropy, right? This is the amount of entropy that you lose by forming a bond. Before uh, having, forming the bond, you have a log V. When you form the bond, you have a log VB. And so the ratio is V per particle divided by VB. And this is the Boltzmann factor. So you have entropy here, and then in this, in this contribution, I call it there, and then you have the energy scale. U0 is the energy scale of the bond. So how much, what is the strength of the bond? And so in a unit of kT, you multiply by, by beta. So this is the energetic uh, attraction between the particle, and this is the number of microstates in which you can form a bond compared to the number of microstates that you sample if you're not bonded, essentially. And this is the, how it looks like. And now you see that uh, the, the entropy has an important role in this, in this process because it controls the, 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 the sharpness of this bonding transition. Right? If, you, if you want to make this transition from an unbonded state to a bonded state very sharp, what you have to do, you have to decrease the entropy. So you have to make sure that the, the bonding volume is very tiny compared to the, bonding, to the volume of the system. So you can, in designing your particle, you, you can play with the interaction range and with the angle of the cone in case of a patchy particle and control this quantity here and make the transition as, as sharp as you want. And this is also shown in this inset where you, all these things are not being normalized by the melting temperature. You see that it becomes sharper when you increase the difference in entropy between the bonded and the, and the unbonded state. The other important thing is that the melting temperature, the temperature where you have a 50% of bond form, also goes down by increasing the energy, by increasing the, the difference in entropy. So more entropy means that uh, the self-assembly process will take place at much, much lower temperature. Right? So since this temperature point at the end is the quantity that is going to control to the lifetime of the bonds, if you want to have persistent aggregates, you must form them at low temperature. So you really need uh, to, to work very large difference in entropy between bonded and bonded state if you want to have a persistent clusters at low temperatures. Okay? That's the message that comes from this simple exercise. Okay, so let's uh, try to do it uh, in a few, few other cases. Uh, the case of equilibrium polymers. So those are now patchy particles with uh, functionality two. So these particles can bind to another part and form a chain. The partition function, I repeated it here, the standard partition function that we wrote. Remember this one here. So let's now try to calculate. Let's calculate for a specific sequence of particles. So particle number one, I put it in the origin. This will be with the, the volume term, right, which I didn't write. Now I, I move close to particle number two. I have to put it within the bonding volume to, to be to satisfy this constraint, so we'll get a VB, e to the minus beta u. 
And so now I have a timer, now I add the third party, got the third party, I can put it only here. So I have another VP, e to the minus beta u, the fourth particle, I can put it here, and so on. So I, uh, my partition function for a specific uh, orientation uh, uh, ordering of the particle is going to be VP e to the minus beta u multiplied to n minus 1, because the number of bonds that I have in the system is n minus 1. On top of that, I have also to, to consider that uh, this has been calculated for a specific uh, ordering of my particles. So now I have to permute all my particles, and I have to permute the particle both in particle label and in touch label. So I get an additional terms, which is this one here, which is all the possible ways I can orient, uh, or, or, uh, orient my particle and form my bonds. So n factorial way of uh, ordering my, my particles, one, two, three, Two, one, three, and so on, blah, blah, blah. And then two to the n, which comes from the possible way of taking the patches. There are two patches per particle. And then I have to divide by two because at the end I can generate the same chains in two ways, left from left to right and right to left. So this n factorial, of course, will cancel this n factorial. That was there for this reason, you know. But there is this two to the n, which comes from the orientational part there. Anyway, you have your partition function. It's another way that uh, emphasizes the role of entropy in, uh, oh, by, by the way, this, this means, uh, remember uh, the, the, the structure of, of the structure, that uh, the number of chains of length n is going to be exponential, because you see, it's, uh, everything is uh, something to the power n. So see, this is e to the n log something. So you are going to find that an exponential distribution of, of chains. So if you a particle with functionality two, and you mix them together, if they are really non-interacting, you're going to find an exponential distribution of chains always. Another way where you can uh, see how this uh, exponentiality comes essentially from entropy, you can do the same type of calculation in a slightly different way. You say, okay, I know that I have a certain number of particles, and I assume that I know what is the number of bonds that are already in the systems. What is, uh, how can I arrange the particle to satisfy the constraint that I have a fixed number of bonds and still maximize uh, the entropy? So how do you do it? You say, okay, I have two, two constraints. The total number of particles is fixed. The total number of bonds is fixed. So each particle has n, man, uh, each cluster of sites n has n minus one bond. It's a polymer. So this is also fixed. And now you, you have your, your entropy, which is uh, the, the standard for an ideal gas. And now you have to just to maximize this, this free energy under these two constraints. You do that, blah, blah, blah. There is some math. You have this in, in, the, in the notes, or you can look at it again at, at, the, at the movie on, on the web. And uh, what you get at the end, let me go fast. What you get at the end, OK, so this is the two Lagrange multiplier. You solve this, and blah, blah, blah. And you get this distribution here in terms of the fraction of the probability of having a bond. This is the exponential distribution that I was telling you before. So two different ways. Or you do the things exactly uh, with thermodynamics, or you do it uh, again by just maximizing the entropy, similar things. How does it look like? High temperature monomer, low temperature chains. The chains are distributed. This is the distribution of chains. Uh, and as you see, they are nice exponential distributions. Only when you go to, this is on increasing the density at the, a low temp, some low temperature. This is temperature in unit of the depth of the bond. And, and you see that only a very high density, you start to see deviations from this exponential behavior, in the red and the green curve, which are due to the fact that now at a certain point, the, the polymers start to interact with each other. And so you start to lose this concept of, uh, of an ideal uh, gas of clusters. But uh, apart from that, I mean, the, the agreement is pretty good. Okay, so let me now go to a little bit more uh, complicated case. When there are now particles with uh, functionality in general, functionality F, in this case, I have functionality B, and we have to do the same, same story. We, we need to know how many bonds there are at certain number, density and temperature. And uh, once, once you know the number of bonds, we need that theory to calculate the cluster side distribution that we have to, and this is again just entropy, it's just a geometric property of the system. How many clusters can I get if I have a certain number of bonds in the system? Now, this can be solved analytically in mean field. Again, what does it mean in mean field in this case? This means that we neglect all clusters in which there are closed loop of bonds, like you have here. So all my clusters will have branching points, will be as, uh, as complicated as you like, but there will be no internal loops. 
under this constraint, I can solve my problem. With that constraint, the problem becomes uh, unsoluble. There is only a scaling argument that tells you what uh, the real distribution are going to be. So let's try to solve the problem in this uh, mean field limit. Today is the mean field day, right? What is the cluster side distribution and how the particles self-assemble into cluster? And this was uh, solved a long time ago, by 1943, by the Stockmeyer. All these things are coming back now with patchy physics, but they were already solved by, by polymer people. So we have again to find what is the most probable distribution with the two constraints that we fix the number of uh, particles and we fix the number of constraints, which is nothing more than fixing the total number of clusters in the system. Right? Because when you have assumed that uh, there are no loops, this means that every time you add a bond in your system, you decrease by one the number of clusters. Right? You start with n particles. You add a bond, so you connect two particles, so you make a cluster. So you decrease by one the total number of clusters in the system. Another bond, another connection, another cluster that disappear. And so the number of bonds is nothing more than the number of clusters in the system. So what you have to do, we have to calculate uh, our partition function. This is the total number of, of ways that you can have. We know this. This is the quantity that we need to calculate. In how many different ways we can arrange particles which have functionality 3, in this case, or functionality f in general, and still uh, and form uh, loopless uh, clusters. This is the quantity that we need to calculate. Then, once uh, we, we have that quantity, we again we have the two constraints, we write our free energy, we minimize this two Lagrange multiplier A and B here, and you get the result. The result is this one, again, is similar to the one we have for timers, but this is the quantity that we really need to calculate to, to solve this problem. So this will be the energetic part. This is going to be some number of bonds, but this is the entropic part. That's what we need to calculate now. Okay, so I do it just for two simple cases that I can do here on the blackboard. So let's say that we have dimers. How many different uh, dimers we can form? This is, and it's easy to see that if I have pa two particles and I label the patches and the number of different ways I can arrange the particle and form a bond between these two is uh, number of patches and squared as a functionality squared and then you get nine different ways. So this is easy to, to uh, those are written here. So I can have a, 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 a D bond, a E bond, a F bond, B D bond, B E, B F, C D, C E, C F. Those are all possible bonds that you can have. Nine. Now let's go to trimer. Trimer, I, I can have making 162 different ways. First of all, I can form three different trimers. One to two, one to dimers. One to two, one and two, one and three, and, and two and three. And each of them will be made in nine ways, right? Now I have to add the, the additional particle to each of them. And this additional particle, like if it's a dimer, there will be four uh, available bond inside. And the incoming particle will have three available bond inside. So there will be five, five, four times three ways to mix the timer with the trimer. And so now, again, you divide by two to avoid overcounting. And that's what you get to the 160. I leave you as an exercise to do the calculation, which still is doable for uh, the case of uh, four particles. It's just a, a slight com complication, so I, I show it here, but I try to forget. A, you have to be careful because you have to separate configurations which are linear when you do this calculation and configurations which are star-like. Because those are different topology in the system. But uh, so you, you sum the one on linear as, as to be 3,888, the one with, uh, with the branch uh, 648. So these things can be done. I mean, there is uh, this nice article by Stockmeyer Beautiful article. I mean, just uh, this is an appendix, uh, one page, and uh, it gives the solution, formal solution for all this uh, cluster there. And uh, this works. Uh, what, what does it predict? It predicts that this is the total number of, of this of cluster, the this cluster side distribution that you get. Again, this is the entropic term that we have calculated, and those are the Lagrange multiplier which are connected to the number of bonds, and so you see that here. But what do, we, what do you get as, a, as, a, as answer is that uh, when you increase uh, the number of bonds in the system, the cluster gets bigger and bigger, and when you reach this critical value of 0.5, you, you end up with this uh, power law distribution that signals the present, the start that the system has reached percolation. So there is a, an infinite cluster which has an infinite size in the system that is formed. And this, uh, of course, this is uh, the mean field percolation value. It will be uh, need to be corrected with uh, in the real in, in real systems, but uh, still give you an idea of how these things are uh, happening. 
And, and for this type of system, you can even calculate everything for this, uh, for even the asymptotic uh, shape of the cluster site distribution close to percolation. And it shows you that the goes with the cluster site to the power minus 2.5, which is the mean fit exponent for the cluster site distribution. Which means that all cluster sites are there. I mean, there, there is no typical sites. There is no characteristic, characteristic site. They have a really um, self-similar distribution of clusters in the system. So how good is uh, all this? Uh, this is pretty good uh, for small valence systems. So here I compare simulation result and this Floristock-Meyer uh, result for clusters uh, which are made by particles with a very tiny valence. So it's a mixture of particles with valence 2 and valence 3. So this is uh, the valence, the small valence, as I said, create very few loops in the system. And as a result of this absence of loop, the Floristock-Meyer theory becomes uh, exact. And there, is, there are no fitting parameters here, just the theory and the, the cluster side distribution that you see here. Of course, if I go, you go to larger uh, functionality, then you start to see, even in the computer simulation, deviation from the theoretical results and the mean field results. Okay, so I have uh, just ten, uh, 10 minutes, so I think I have time to, to show you some cases, uh, not all of them, some cases in which uh, this uh, self-assembly process, uh, which is, as you, as you saw, con uh, resulting from entropy part, the energy, and the uh, entropic part, the number of different ways you can put the clusters, can be tailored to produce very interesting thermodynamic phase diagram. And let me start with, uh, again, from a paradigmatic case, which I like. It's uh, this, uh, the dipolar hard spheres. So those are colloids, colloidal particles, which have a dipole uh, in the middle. So it's an hard sphere with a dipole. This is in the interaction potential that you all know. It was a simulation by Camp and colleagues in 2000. And, and you see what happens when the temperatures start to be low. The system starts to form very long chains uh, in which the dipole of the particle align and then there are some branching points. So this is uh, this, uh, this uh, simulation here generated uh, a theory from, again, the same saffron that we were discussing before. Of course, he, he knew about entropy a lot, so it was a good uh, uh, case to, to look at. And uh, he, he, he argued in this way. He said, in some sense, a low temperature, all possible part, the particle will all be essentially in this uh, chain-like configuration. But of course, uh, this, there will be some defects in this, uh, in this. The system will not be at the ground state. The, the ground state will be just one infinite long chain. But uh, there will be some defect. And there are two possible defects. Chain ends, so this particle is not bonded. This is two chain ends, two defects that I have here. Or they can be branching points. In some points, uh, a chain ends uh, touch uh, um, a chain and bind, and of course uh, the binding will be uh, with the energy which is higher than the, the, the one that you have in, in the linear configuration. In this sense, it's a defect. So cost it would be better to have a, an independent chain than, than a dime. So, so can I, uh, uh, again, so I can think of this as, a, again, a, an entropic phenomenon, because uh, what is going to stabilize uh, the formation of uh, a low temperature, I know that I'm going to find chains. At intermediate temperature, if uh, the entropy associated to the formation of this branching point, and you see that this branching point you can form in many ways, you can put the branching point in many different points on the incoming chain. If entropy is sufficiently large, then perhaps uh, I can, uh, despite this an energetic cost, I can stabilize a network phase, which will be this, this type of structure that you there. So how can I write a free energy to describe this? Then it gets the idea say, let's uh, assume that I call phi the, the density of ants. Now, of course, uh, uh, if you, you need two ants to form a chain, so the density of chains will be proportional to phi square, and you need three ants to form a branching point, so you have a, 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 a density of branching Excuse point proportional me. to this phi to the cube. And then you can write again, uh, this is in Safran style, a uh, free energy which says, okay, the only object that I have in my system are this, uh, the, ch the, the end and the branching point. And so, surely enough, each of them will have a, a, a free energy contribution of the order of kT. So I write my free energy as the number of, essentially, of defects that I have in my system, which are the only relevant elements, times kT. And I add, put a little bit of virial repulsions in terms of uh, total density in the system. 
So this is the, the excluded volume interaction between the particles, and that's the, the physics of this uh, branching and ends. So you do that, you calculate, uh, you take the derivative, you calculate the equation of states, that's uh, what comes out. You put a real, reasonable parameter for uh, the bonding volume of the, of the defect, of the branching, the bonding volume of, uh, and, and the energy of the branching, and you put a cost for the, for the end. You put all these things together and you get this nice phase diagram here that, uh, that you see. Here. And this is uh, a very interesting phase diagram because it's a gas-liquid phase separation. You go from here, gas, and liquid there, which takes place at very low densities. Look at the, at the density scale here. This is back in fraction. This is 0.08 in back in fraction, so very confined. And on top of that, the liquid density goes to zero. The, the liquid, the density of the liquid coexisting with the gas goes to zero when I cool it down. So you get uh, a, a, a liquid which is really empty in, in this region here. So it's not very different from what we ever discussed yesterday about the spatchy particle that produce uh, very uh, uh, phase diagram which has shifted on the left. And you can indeed understand this in terms of patchy particles as I will show you before because essentially here you have a, functionality three, particle with functionality three, when you have a lot of branching. But now you decrease the temperature, the branching becomes a free energy more costly, you decrease their number, so the average functionality goes down and you get a system with a, a liquid which retrace on the left. So this is a beautiful work of San Safran. And for a few years, for a few years people believe that this could be exactly the phase diagram of the polar R spheres. Uh, so this is a uh, dipolar particle, uh, which is of uh, Yana's scale, right? Which is? Uh, which is Yana's in, uh, in the patch coverage. It no, no, this is just a dipolar particle. No, I just draw it uh, to, in this way to, to convey the direction of the dipole. Okay, so it's, it's an isotropic It's particle. an isotropic. It's an R-sphere R -sphere plus dipolar interaction. Sorry for the misunderstanding. No. Okay, just so, an R -sphere. so even if it is dipolar, uh, so I would expect it to actually cluster around than form a chain. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there are two charges coming into the picture now. So, like, uh, how much of uh, polarity is there, kind of? So to, to see this, uh, this uh, chaining phenomenon that you see in the simulation or here in my drawing, you need to go to low temperature because you need to make uh, this interaction dominant. And this interaction will favor bipolar alignment. So, so if you... So the, the, the area of interaction is pretty small in that case. It's not... Uh, spread up, spread up. But this is, there is no, there's just one dipole in the center of a sphere. Okay. So there's an R sphere. And in the middle of a sphere, I put a little dipole, a strong dipole, actually. Okay. Strong compared to KT, if you want to, I mean, the dipolar interaction has to be strong if I want to have this uh, chaining phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Indeed, it's so strong that in an experiment, they cannot really get there. Because uh, if you make, usually those particles are uh, 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 single crystal, ferroelectric, and then embedded in a, in a, in a, in a polymer. And uh, if you make the single crystal too big, then it becomes a polycrystal. So there is a maximum amount of uh, dipole that you can put in these colloidal particles, which unfortunately is, does not really allow you to test this theory. But me, people believe this theory for a few years, but uh, just uh, I don't want to leave you with the impression that that is the correct theory, because we did the simulation recently, or recently a few years ago, with a very sophisticated numerical technique to equilibrate uh, at this, uh, under these conditions, and uh, we found out that uh, as the Safran theory is killed by the fact that he neglected the possibility of formation of rings. You see how many rings there are in the system? A low temperature. Those rings were not included in his theory, and uh, they killed the theory completely. So the, as, to, as to today, I mean, up to the lowest temperature we've been able to simulate, which is pretty low, we found no evidence of any gas-liquid phase coexistence in uh, dipolar. So these uh, particles do not have a gas-liquid coexistence, at least that's what we believe today. Everything goes away. Oof. Nice. Yes. Okay, but uh, the idea was good, right? So can we generate this, this type of uh, reentrant phase diagram with the patchy particles? I mean, let's, let's see if you have understood the idea. So we need uh, a particle which can form chains, so you need two patches, the green patches, and you need to add the possibility of forming some branching points. So let's add another patch, a different type, 
and such that this can only bind to the green. So you can have only these blue-green bonds. And this will be the branching point of saffron, right? So now I put in my model exactly the ingredient which were in the saffron theory. Um, let's see what is, the, is going to be the ground state for this system. So let's assume that it's a, a long chain. Now let's look at, let's follow my reasoning. I break the chain in two parts, and this will cost me epsilon ee. So I lose one bond when I break this infinite chain, and this has a cost which is, a cost which is epsilon a. Now I take these two ends and I join them with the existing chain. So I take these ends and I join it with that one, and I take this end and I join it with that one. And now by joining them, I gain this amount of energy which comes from the formation of these two bonds. Right? So now I have this possibility, or this this uh, epsilon a minus two times epsilon a b is greater than zero, which means that now, in this case, uh, this configuration has a lower, fee en a lower energy than that one. I've gained energy by breaking and reforming, so creating branching point. Or I'm in the opposite uh, direction, and the, the, the chain is the ground state. So there is this pe peculiar value or ratio between these two energy scales, 0.5, that tells you that uh, if you do a, a model or a simulation in which this is less than that, less than 0.5 epsilon a, chains are going to win at low temperature. And if it's larger, then branching points are going to win. Now, this is the region that we all commonly know. This is the region where systems face separate, they form liquid, the liquid are dense and networks. This is the new physics. When the system where a low temperature can be different, can be a, a, a liquid of chains. Okay, so you do the simulation for this, for this model. And of course, uh, uh, and, uh, if you pick a sufficiently large bonding volume, this is very important. I, again, you saw that in the thermodynamics, uh, uh, the, the importance of the bonding volumes in, in the formation of, of the temperature which you form bonds. If this is not very large, then the, the bond, the blue-green bonds, even if they are energetically stable, they will not form an entropic reason. You saw that when this was, the bonding volume was small, then the bonds don't form unless you go to very low temperature. So if you want that uh, on increasing, at a certain point, these bonds start to form and to, so to overcome the probability of forming chains always at all temperatures, then you need to make this very large. So you need a very large bonding volume. But if you put that one, then immediately you see those are the simulations, the results that you get. And that this is the theoretical prediction based on this vert time theory that I discussed you before. In this case, it's the full vert time theory. So we have a, a possibility of designing interaction which creates this uh, strange uh, phase diagram. Does the time theories doesn't have doesn't have loops. Yeah, it's this one. And this this line here. No, it's for the for this one. But this model is has the same physics of the some some safram. So we did realize a same safram type Apache particle model. No, the loops are there. You see the difference between this theoretical curve and the simulations in this case. But uh, the, 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 the topology of the phase diagram is, uh, pre is preserved. Okay, so I can conclude with this, with this slide at 16 seconds. You can uh, play with the different, uh, with the different st relative strength. You see that uh, if you make the, and, and you get that always, this is the theory, those are the simulations, so always the same type of shape. You see that you also kill, you, you kill the, the saffron type transition if uh, the, the bonds become too weak. And so even from an energetic point of view, you, you don't create enough branching in the system and then you have always chain or all temperatures. Okay, I think this is a, a good point uh, to stop. And uh, if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer. And we can go to eat. Good, we had enough during the talk.